Knowing, in the sense of that wordless remembrance that instantly comes to us, is an essential part of our soul's journey back home, which is nowhere in the spatial and material sense. Yet just that knowing, that remembrance, is not enough to feed that connection to beyond the falsehood of the material realm and the observing character himself. Being impossible to translate directly, given the opposite nature of the, so to speak, material mind, in relation to the truth mind, it requires that the knowing is applied in action, once interpreted and translated mentally as best as possible. Action here not in the sense that it is necessarily an act or a set of them, but in the sense that it needs then to also be translated from the mind into influencing the material world. This is because, in my view, the material world is a mirror for our shadow selves, that is, our allowed parasites, created and repressed only to reflect themselves back at us, the observers at the center, as events in the realm of matter and time, as I had mentioned previously. And this is for those who do have an observer centered, but that is another matter altogether. It is pertinent, I feel, to make a note at this point to state that, in my individual opinion, despite the reflection type of behavior from the matter and time realm towards our own repressed identification with falsehood, or sins, so to speak, the realm's programmed system and those involved in its maintenance do not behave as if it was a school or a learning center. A clinic, perhaps more so, if the healing needed willpower from the self to overcome its own sick state. I still maintain, however, that the time and matter realm is a prison for the true soul, a jail with no bars, and where the guards can only try to convince us, and tempt the parasites we identify with, to remain. So, we become, through our identification with the realm of matter and time, the enforcers of our own enslavement. Nevertheless, as discussed in the metaphors of Tumor's contemplation, it is indeed more about allowing the shadow identification to be eaten away so that the pure self can return to himself. But this is, again, merely my view, and it always, as ever, requires your own contemplation. So, going back to the necessary action or influence upon the world, this is the application of that knowing, the proof, if you like, that the remembrance is accepted and replaces that previous part of identification. The mirror of the realm will always work as a test to the realizations and revelation until they are applied as an influence in the actual world of matter and time. So when one obtains the revelation that a habit is part of an identification with something false, a parasite, the world will mirror that and test that knowing by providing several cues that point towards resuming the habit that one knows should be dropped. Resisting temptation is part of it, surely, but also not the whole process, in my view, because if it is merely a struggle against the parasite, a fight to deny it, it is still holding it in repression, in shadow territory. Like in the Frankenstein novel that I had also mentioned previously, the monster was forsaken, denied, and fought, but never confronted and appeased. Never was the fault and responsibility of Dr. Frankenstein for the creation of this, his destructive parasite, truly resolved. In this sense, there is a sort of connection between the outline of Frankenstein and the outline of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Both are creator and created in different characters. One, an elevated facade, the other a destructive monster repressed into the shadow. So again, in my view, the struggle to resist temptation is not enough, and it might even strengthen and feed the repression itself. It is by applying that alchemy, 
as for instance was discussed in the contemplation with that title, towards the shadow creatures we created and identified with, that the miracle then occurs. And that requires that the knowing or remembrance of what was revealed is then applied and influences the world, thereby influencing and transmuting also the shadow creature in question. Have you noticed how, in classical mythologies, and surely not just European, the creation of a god will always eventually strive to overthrow his creator? How the slaves will eventually revolt and rise to become the slavers of their previous masters? Or, if I am allowed to use my own allegorical uh, translation, how the bacteria and fungi will feast upon the tumor that generated their existence. The self-blinded Oedipus is an excellent metaphor for the shame of sin, the pride that accompanies it and protects it, and the self-inflicted blind condition that results from them until these are transmuted alchemically, metaphorically speaking. So we now come to discuss the title of this contemplation, Service. Service is the application of the alchemical magnum opus, that is, the application of the revealed knowing into the created mercury or lead of matter, so that it returns to gold. The creator must serve the created, or, allegorically, the Dr. Frankenstein must serve his monster. This does not mean being slave to the monster or the created, quite the contrary. True service is not only voluntary, but it is also not based upon falsehood. A true leader, for example, will be his follower's first servant. Not that he is a slave to his followers, but that he offers himself willingly, with all the best that he has to offer, to lead them truly. He may fail, he may make mistakes, which are an unavoidable part of the imperfect condition we are in. But if he is conscious of his alchemical process in this service, he will not succumb to the temptation of shame, guilt or pride. Resentment for his previous shortcomings in his submersion into this true service will not linger, not because he fights them off, which would repress it and feed the shadow, but because he has understood that he himself is in no condition to prevent mistakes and faults. It is through our attempt at the truest service to our own inner creatures, or creations, so to speak, when we find ourselves also lacking when walking in their shoes, that realization, compassion and alchemical transmutation may occur. When transmuted by our service, the created shadow will rise up again as gold and resume its proper place in our soul, connected to spirit. So my individual contemplation brought me to this point, to say that one has to, at some point, accept, voluntarily and willingly, as a centered ego, to be of service to our shadows, to listen to them, to provide for them, to walk with them. Our shadows that hurt us, imprison us, fight us, they are fallen parts of our true selves. Under this light, take a fresh look at Matthew 25 from 34 to 40, and do not take it literally. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? 
Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me.